In many of my previous videos, I showed the design and programming of my little brain PCB that I designed in KiCad. This board contains a fairly powerful STM32 microcontroller, sensors, and other peripherals. Unfortunately, due to the global chip shortage these days, the parts for that board are not available anymore, at least for reasonable amounts of money. I therefore decided to redesign and add some features to this little brain PCB in Altium Designer and order a number of these from JLC PCB so that, if you want, you can follow along with all tutorials at home by ordering one of these yourself. In future videos, I'll do a board bring up, which includes testing and writing drivers for this board, as well as some tutorials on DSP, SM32, and so forth. In this video, I'll show you my design choices for this board using Altium Designer and how to get one for yourself from JLC PCB. I had these boards made and assembled by JLC PCB in China who are also sponsoring this video. If you'd like to order one for yourself, you can go to my GitHub page at github.com slash PMS67 and locate the Little Brain Plus Plus repository over here. You can also check out the old Little Brain repository which contains a lot of the driver examples, firmware, DSP and so on to follow along with the previous videos. All necessary design and manufacturing files are in this repository, ready to order. I'll show you how to order these boards from JLC PCB at the end of this video. As you've seen, I've used Altium Designer for this board to show you how it can be used, also in comparison to KiCad, to design a fairly simple SCM32 based PCB. If you would like to try out Altium Designer for yourself, you can go to altium.com slash yt slash philslab to get a free trial. The link is in the description below as well. But for now, let's get started with the design walkthrough. Here we are in Altium Designer looking at the schematic of the Little Brain Plus Plus. This is divided into three parts, and thus also into three schematic pages. One for the power supply, one for the microcontroller and some peripherals, and lastly, one page containing two sensors. Let's go through them one by one. First, let's look at the very simple power supply for this board. I've tailored this board to my specific needs and therefore opted to only allow the board to be powered via USB, which has a nominal plus five volt rail. Since the components on this board don't consume much current, typically less than 100 milliamps, I've gone with a simple LDO low dropout regulator rather than a switching converter. The MIC5219 shown here can actually supply up to about 500 milliamps of current should there be a need for this. So it's a bit oversized for this application, but more than sufficient. As I said before, the supply rails come from a USB connection and this supply rail is typically rather noisy. So I'm using a Pi filter here to filter out high frequency content from the DC supply. This is in the form of two 2.2 microfarad capacitors to ground and a series farad bead. The second capacitor over here is actually also the input capacitor for the low dropout regulator. According to the regulator datasheet, we require at least one microfarad capacitors on both the input and the output of this device for stability. Now this particular regulator also has an additional pin that needs to be bypassed with a 470 picofarad capacitor to further reduce the noise on the rail. So I've added that here. On development boards like this, I like to have a power on LED, which you can see over here. The current limiting resistor is chosen to be one kilo ohm, which may seem large to some, but I find LEDs for these use cases are typically bright enough when driven with about two milliamps of current. Before we move on, notice the numbering scheme of the component designators. For multi-page schematics, assuming less than 100 components per schematic page, each schematic page is given a specific number range. For example, page one is from 100, page two is from 200, and page three from 300, and so forth. This is great for routing and debugging into later stages, as I can quickly jump to the correct schematic page. Here we are at the second schematic page, that of the STM32 microcontroller, debug connector, SD card, and GPIO header. Let's go through each subsection, which I've grouped using Altium Designer's drawing tools to make the schematic easier to read. Firstly, I've opted for a fairly powerful STM32F4 microcontroller, the STM32F411 to be precise. This can run up to about 100 megahertz and includes things such as a floating point unit, which really helps with DSP applications, for example. I didn't need much IO capability and therefore I chose an MCU with a low pin count. For pretty much all STM32 microcontrollers, we'll need some basic circuitry to get them running. This includes the decoupling capacitors, and in particular, we'll need one 100 nanofarad capacitor per VDD pin. This includes the VBAT and VREF plus pin. I also like to add a larger 
bulk decoupling capacitor, this one over here, 2.2 microfarads, which is placed close to the IC itself. Then we may have pins like the VCAP pin over here, which are specific to some MCUs and which require a low ESR 2.2 microfarad decoupling capacitor. You can see I've tied boot zero to ground as I will only be programming the board via serial wire debug or SWD for short. If you'd like to enable ST's bootloader, for example, if you want to program this via UART or USB, you will need to pull boot zero high, for example, via a dip switch. The MCU itself has an internal high speed crystal. However, for better accuracy, I would almost always recommend to add an external crystal. I've chosen a 16 megahertz crystal in this case, which according to the data sheet has a nine picofarad load capacitance. This crystal requires two external load capacitors. I've arrived at a value of 10 picofarads for these by taking the crystal's nine picofarad load capacitance, subtracting roughly four picofarads of stray capacitance due to routing, and then multiplying that number by two. The last part of the crystal circuitry is this feed resistor over here. This is to limit the drive strength of the circuit, which may overdrive the crystal and thus create distortions. I typically keep the resistance value fairly low and you may need to experiment with this value a tiny bit. Once we have this basic circuitry in place, that means our MCU can boot up. But we'll also need to decide on a pinout, of course. For this, I pretty much always use stm 32 cubide so let's go over to that now. Here we are in stm 32 cubide which is a free development environment for the STM32 microcontroller platform. I have various other videos showing in more detail how to set up STM32 Cube IDE from scratch, so let me just briefly walk you through some steps here. So I've chosen my MCU, which is the STM32 F411. Here I can choose essentially my pinout and configurations. I can either click on individual pens and set them, for example, as inputs, outputs, and so forth, or I typically go on the left side here and then choose my peripherals. For example, I might go into the system section and enable my serial wire debug with a trace output, and then that shows me the relevant pins over here. Then I could do something with the crystal. I will enable the high speed external crystal, and this selects the pins here. For example, I can enable I2C lines by going to connectivity, click on I2C, and then enabling those pins. If I control click on the pins, I can see alternate placements. For example, this pin could move over here. Once I've selected all the peripherals I want, I can also add some middleware, for example, USB drivers or FAT file system drivers and so forth, but I also need to set up my clock. And the way I do that is go to clock configuration. In the HSE, the high speed external crystal part, I choose my clock frequency with the 16 megahertz, and I would like to run at a system speed of 100 megahertz. Then I can press enter, press OK, and STM32 cube IDE will set all of these PLL values automatically for me, given my HSE frequency and my desired CPU clock frequency. And that's pretty much all there is to STM32 Cube IDE. You then click save and the basic structure of a project is created for you. Now back in Altium Designer, we can continue with the peripherals of the microcontroller. Firstly, I will be using serial wire debug or SWD to program and debug the MCU. The main connections are SWDIO and SWClock. However, I've included SWO as a trace output and the N reset signal to allow me to do a hardware reset. All of these connections are routed to what's called a tag connect header. In essence, this is a special adapter for the ST-Link debug probe, which allows you to use pogo pins and pads to debug your boards. This saves the cost and space requirements of a connector. You can also see I've added some ESD protection in the form of TVS diodes and some current limiting resistors. I also have a USB connector up here, which supplies power to the board and lets us interface with the microcontroller, for example, via a virtual COM port to visualize data. Then we have an SD card connector, which is connected via a four bit wide SDIO interface to the microcontroller. Again, we have ESD protection and filtering of the supply to the SD card. The data and command lines require pull up resistors. However, the clock pin does not. I've placed a series termination resistor on the clock line to aid with ringing and other signal integrity issues. The card detect pin over here requires a very weak pull down resistor as the SD card has its own internal pull up resistor that makes this pin go high when inserted. Finally, I've added a simple six pin JST GH connector to this board to allow for minimal further expansion. I've hooked the connector pins up to a filtered power and ground and four of the connector pins to the microcontroller. Again, with ESD protection and current limiting resistors. 
Here we are at the third and final page of the schematic. This page contains the two sensors available on the Little Brain++ board. An inertial measurement unit containing gyroscopes and accelerometers, in this case it's the MPU6050, and a barometric pressure sensor to measure quantities, for example the altitude. And in this case I've chosen the SPL06001, which is very similar to the Bosch BMP280. Both of these sensors can be interfaced with via I2C. I've hooked them up to two separate buses on the microcontroller, I2C1 and I2C2, to make sure they don't interfere with each other and that I can maximize my data transfer rates. The schematics for these two sensors are very simple and can be read up in the relevant data sheets. As usual, we need to connect the I2C data and clock lines to the microcontroller. As we saw on the microcontroller schematic page, I've placed the I2C pull-up resistors there and for a 3.3 volt supply, I typically go with 2.2 kilo ohm pull-up resistors. This is sufficient even for I2C fast mode at 400 kilohertz. Then we'll need some decoupling at each VDD pin. For example, here, here, and here. The remaining pins I've hooked up according to what the datasheet tells us to do. And typically you will find that in every sensor or device datasheet. Luckily, both sensors also have interrupt output pins here and here. In practice, this will then tell us when data is ready to be transferred from a sensor. That's pretty much it for the schematic of the Little Brain Plus Plus. Now let's move over to the PCB design. Here's the Little Brain Plus Plus board in Altium Designer's 3D viewer. This board is pretty compact at about 40 by 40 millimeters, and this is a four layer board using JLC PCB's impedance controlled stack up, which we'll need for the SD card data lines as well as for the USB differential pair. I've opted for a signal ground ground signal stack up for better EMI and signal integrity performance. In Altium Designer, I can set up my layer stack up with things like dielectric thickness, copper weights, and so on. Once I've done that, I can calculate the trace widths to give the required impedances. Here I've done that for 50 ohm single layer traces for the SD card, for example, and a 90 ohm differential pair for the USB data lines. If you're not using Altum Designer, you can also use GLC PCB's controlled impedance calculator. You can simply type in impedance value, choose how many layers, the thickness of your PCB, if it's inner layer or outer layer, and if it's single ended or differential, click the arrow and it'll tell you the recommended trace width. Since JLC PCB at the moment only supports single sided assembly, the board layout is a bit cramped and some of the placements aren't entirely optimal. However, it's fairly decent for what this board needs to do. The connectors are placed at the board edges, over here, here, and here, with decoupling capacitors and ESD protection as close as possible to the connectors themselves. Looking at the power supply over here, it's good practice to keep decoupling capacitors, this one and this one, as close as possible to the LDO regulator. Less critical components, such as the on LED over here, can be placed further away. For this board, since I'm using both internal layers strictly for ground planes, I've routed the 3.3 volt rail, which you can see routed with this very thick trace on the bottom layer here. For the speeds this board is running at, this is absolutely sufficient, and we do not require a dedicated power plane. The microcontroller is a QFN package, which is not the easiest to root out due to tight space constraints. However, I've tried to prioritize components such as the decoupling capacitors. Placing these decoupling capacitors as close as possible to the device, with thick traces connecting them, as well as power puddles, as you can see over here. The power puddles are essentially small copper pores linking the power nets together. Every time I require a ground connection, I can simply route a short wide trace out from a pad and dig down into the internal ground planes with vias. The crystal section is also kept quite close to the microcontroller with the load capacitors over here placed in line with the crystal signal traces. The debug and IO traces take a fairly low priority in this design and were done last. However, care needs to be taken for the SDIO interface for the SD card and the USB data line routing. These should ideally be controlled impedance traces, as shown before. Although not strictly necessary, I've actually length matched the SDIO data lines, as you can see here with these squiggly traces, and in Altium that's quite easy to do. I can do interactive length tuning and interactive differential pair length tuning. Finally, we have the two sensors, up here the inertial measurement unit and down here the barometric pressure sensor. Both of these devices have decoupling capacitors very close to the sensors themselves and to the relevant power pins. I2C as an interface is fairly forgiving in terms of routing, so these traces have a fairly low priority and can be routed in a pretty rough manner. 
You can see these ground vias here, which seem to not be doing very much. However, these ground vias are placed close to signal vias because I am using two ground planes. So when these signals, for example, I squared C lines here, change reference plane, so change the ground plane, I place a ground via close to these vias to maintain a good return path. This helps with EMI and signal integrity. I've also placed several stitching vias around the board, which are essentially ground vias stitching the two internal ground planes together. Lastly, I've added some silk screen over here, here, and then also on the back to indicate the board name, revision, logo, and so forth. Now, all that was left to do was to do a design rule check, which I can do over here, tools, design rule check in Altium Designer, and then create the Gerber and assembly files. In Altium Designer, we can export the Gerber files by going to File, Publication Outputs, and Gerber X2 files. Then we need to select the relevant files and layers, as well as the drill files, and click OK to export. For assembly, we also require a footprint position file and a bill of materials, or BOM for short. The footprint position file can be created under File, Assembly Outputs, and Generate Pick and Place files. The bill of materials can be created under Reports and Bill of Materials. For JLC PCB, we also need to add the LCSC part number in a separate column in the bill of materials file and fill in the part numbers using the jlcpcb.com slash part site. And you can always see the JLC PCB part number over here. Now let's head over to JLC PCB to place our order. When you're JLC PCB, you can just click on instant quote, then add your Gerber file. This will upload your files for analysis. And once it's uploaded, JLC will fill in information for you. You can also use their Gerber viewer just to check that everything looks all right. Dimensions are 40 by 40 millimeters. You can choose how many PCBs you want. I would like an impedance controlled board with this stack up in my case, and you have to fill in your layer sequence. So top, the first inner layer, second inner layer, bottom layer, silk screen color, surface finish, I typically go for Enoch, copper weight and so forth. And I also typically remove the order number, which is otherwise printed on the silk screen. I would like to have these boards assembled on the top side and tooling holes added by GLC PCB. Click confirm. Now we have to add the bill of materials and the footprint position file. Then click next. Then we can see the automatic system of JLC PCB has matched components. So this is what we selected and this is what the system thinks it's chosen as well as the total cost for all of these parts. This is a good step to verify that everything is right. And when you're happy, click next. Now here we can check our placements of all our parts to, sh to make sure everything's correctly rotated. So you can use this visualizer to just check that. And once you're happy, you can check the total price, which for 10 boards is about 194 US dollars. So less than $20 per board without shipping, without customs. So that's actually pretty good for something like this. So thank you very much for watching this video. If you like the video, please leave a comment and click the like button. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to my channel. And if you have any further video suggestions, please leave them in the comments below. Once I have these boards in my hand assembled and fabricated, I'll be making some board bring up videos. So stay tuned and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye bye.